All right. Can everyone hear me? Awesome. Um, welcome, everyone, um, and thank you for being here. I know it's still early um, for many. Um, my name is Leah. Um, I'm one of the organizers of this um, event, and this event was um, organized by the DSA Socialist Feminist Working Group um, and a newly started abortion access um, campaign committee within that working group. Um, and there's other people from that working group um, here. Um, they should have like a little red dot on their um, name tag. If you have any questions or concerns about the event throughout the day, those are the people that you wanna um, check in with. Um, before we get into um, our first panel, I did wanna go over just a few, um, few things first. One is to thank all the co-sponsors um, of the event today. Um, I think we have a pretty kick-ass list um, of groups that came out um, and help publicize, but are also gonna be here throughout the day in the back at those activist tablings where people can get plugged in directly to work um, at the event today. So again, the co-sponsors are the NYC DSA Socialist Feminist Working Group, New York City for Abortion Rights, Campaign for New York Health, Physicians for a National Health Program, International Women's Strikes, New York City, Abortion Access Front, National Women's Liberation, New York City DSA Medicare for All Working Group, Red Bloom, Feminist Press, and Jacobin Magazine. So thank you everyone um, for, for co-sponsoring. Um, and like I said before, this, was, um, this idea came out of an abortion access committee within the DSA Socialist Feminist Working Group. And um, part of what we felt was that there was a need to kind of combine the spaces that exist right now around kind of political education, educational events, the spaces that exist around activism. And sometimes you can get one or the other. We really wanted to kind of create a space where you could come, um, take part in political conversations, debate, discuss, um, but really focus on the question of like strategy and also plugging people into activism. There's like a lot going on in New York, but it's not often a way to plug into that work. It's not always easy to figure out where to go when you're outraged at home um, daily um, with the attacks and sort of devastation caused um, by the current president. Um, we wanted to um, start the day um, kind of making um, more known and more clear the reproductive justice framework and why that informs and why we hope it informs the strategy used on a number of different fronts. And you'll see that the rest of the day um, takes on kind of specific aspects of reproductive justice and the way that we think um, it'll be helpful for those activists to kind of continue um, that work in the current moment, but also through the memory of what's come um, before us, both historically um, but also some of the activists that kind of inform the strategies that we are hoping um, people will leave today feeling better, better knowledge of. Um, and it's also the case that, um, and you'll hear some of the history in a few minutes, it's also the case that historically there's been a divide around the abortion rights you know, movement, and re reproductive justice movement, um, and then we wanna help bridge that divide for contemporary um, feminists. And so we hope that this day can kind of contribute um, to that. And again, just create a space for people from different groups. Like there's lots of groups in New York City doing really amazing work. We don't always get to be in the same room together, um, meeting each other face to face. And even where we disagree, I think taking some of those debates off Twitter and into like a more humane um, space where we can kind of meet um, face to face and have some of these conversations, I think is um, very, very important. Um, and it's, the idea for this was also kind of modeled a little bit off of an anti-capitalist feminist, con feminist convergence that a bunch of groups came together after, um, I believe it was the second Women's March um, in this space actually, um, and came together to kind of produce an event that also kind of networked amongst kind of the left feminist um, and socialist feminist grouping. So um, that's just a little bit of background about how today came together, and I just wanted to again welcome um, everyone. Um, we strive to make the panels, I think, encompass various aspects of reproductive justice activism, as well as centering speakers from um, oppressed backgrounds. Um, I think we felt sh fell short um, on our goal in this, and I just want to acknowledge that as part of the work um, moving forward. Understanding the limitations of relatively new groupings like ours, but also the limitations of activists to speak and participate after you know, a long work week um, and all the responsibilities that come with um, being especially a woman under capitalism. Um, that said, thank you for being here. I know it's early. I know not everyone lives near Dumbo um, in Brooklyn. So for people who had to commute and deal with the MTA, especially if you're not um, from Brooklyn, thanks again for, um, for being here. Um, we have a lot of work to do, um, and hopefully today will be a start for us, um, especially if you're new to this kind of work, to kind of get plugged into that. So 
Um, the schedule, I won't review it, but everyone should have one um, on their sheet that has some times. If you have some friends that aren't here, you might want to text them and let them know, you know, take a you know, shot of it and let them know when they um, should arrive. Bathrooms are just like a couple housekeeping things. Um, when you walk out and just take a right, we've made both of them gender neutral, right? So um, they will be gender neutral today. Um, we are providing free um, food throughout the day. We have bagels and coffee right now. For lunch, we're ordering um, some really delicious Middle Eastern food. Um, and again, everything is um, free, but we're trying to make it as much back as possible through fundraising. So we do have some donation signs throughout that people should consider um, donating to through Venmo. We will also have a great socialist bake-off. So thank you everyone who's brought baked goods. More are coming. Um, and that will take place during lunch and every attendee will get tickets um, to taste any baked good that they want and then you can do a little vote and then the winner of the Bake Off will win um, a free book. Um, yeah, I think that's it. Um, so I think, is it okay if we do like a little like get to know you thing before you guys start? Okay, I feel like I'm just keeping you guys like waiting. Okay, so um, because a lot of people here don't know each other, which is a good thing, um, I thought before we kind of got into the meat of it, if you could just first turn to someone you do not know, introduce yourself, um, this is gonna be quick, say whether you're currently doing activism related to reproductive justice or if you're looking um, to learn and do more. So you're just gonna answer that question. So someone you don't know, say whether you're currently doing activism or if you're here today to kind of get plugged into it. <laughs> Should we decide on the order? Maybe Jenny can go first. Oh, wonderful. Fantastic. Yeah, yes, please go first. Yes. I don't know. I, I have a little bit of history and then a little bit of analysis, so whatever. I mean, I really want to. Why don't you go next? Yeah, okay. yeah I'll, I'll end. Yeah. And we are, we're not doing the question answer, you're just doing presentations? Yeah. Okay, that's fine. And then I will ask those questions and they don't come up and you can answer them or not. Okay. You know I mean? like, okay. So do you live in the city? All right, we're going to pause. Yeah, I brought my daughter to the She should ask them whether they come up or not. All right, we're going to come back together. And we're just going to popcorn I lost her attention. <laughs> some of them. If people want to popcorn groups that are here, what, who's in the room? Just like popcorn means just like shout out some responses from your conversation. Are people here from different groups? Are people new? New. Woohoo. <laughs> What's NWL? Awesome. Woohoo! Radical women. Woohoo! Brothers. Woohoo! In the back, go ahead. National Advocates for Pregnant Women. Awesome. I'm a Freedom Socialist Party and also a DC Cool, welcome. I'm from Italy, actually. Ooh. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> Thank you for coming all this way, I'm sure, just for this event. <laughs> So raise your hand if you're looking kind of to maybe get more plugged into work. Great, that's like half of us. Awesome. Um, so now you're going to turn to someone you do not know, again, someone different than the person you just talked to, um, and say why you're here, besides getting plugged in. Like, what drove you to this, like, issue in particular? Why are you here? <laughs> We're dragged here by parents. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have a choice? You know what I mean? Totally. What is the pregnant woman uh, a lot? What, what did she say? National. National um, that's um, a group that's really associated with Lynn Paltrow. <laughs> Basically, they defend people who are. Um, either arrested or, or face criminal charges for their pregnancy outcomes, so that could be miscarriage or whatever. Um, and then they also advocate for 
folks like this this woman in Staten Island who didn't want a C-section and was forced to be a yeah, C-section. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That kind of case they're working on. Uh, okay. Yeah. Um, okay, so various forms of pregnancy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. All right. We're going to come back together. And same idea, if you could like just briefly popcorn out some reasons why you or some person that you met is here. That's like everyone read it online and wants to help out. <laughs> You can say why you're here too, you don't have to speak for your partner. I miss learning. Cool. She misses learning. Cool. Take like two more. South Asian country. Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka. Sri Lanka. Thank you. Yeah. Cool. All right, so let's move forward. Um, thanks everyone for participating in that. Hopefully it gets to know people a little bit better. So I am gonna move straight into our speakers that have been very patient. Um, so the first um, panel of the day is called How Did We Get Here? Um, the Past, Present, and Future of Reproductive Justice. And we have um, three amazing panelists here to kick us off um, today. The first speaker will be Marion Jones, um, who's a member of New York City DSA's Socialist Feminist Working Group and serves on the Working Group's Organizing Committee. Um, in the past, she has led reading groups on reproductive justice, black feminism, and prison abolition. So please welcome Marion. <laughs> Following um, Marion will be Jenny Brown, who is the author of Birth Strike, the Hidden Fight Over Women's Work, and Without Apology, which I'm in the middle of right now, and it's fantastic and available um, in the back. Um, and it's now published by Jacobin Inverso. Um, she writes, teaches, and organizes with a dues-funded feminist group, National Women's Liberation. And last will be Titi Bhattacharya, um, who's the Associate Professor of South Asian History at Purdue University. She's a prominent Marxist feminist and is one of the national organizers of the International Women's Strike on March 8, 2017. Um, and she's one of the co-authors of Feminism for the 99%, um, a manifesto, which is also available in the back. And I just found out today has been translated in like 25 languages, which is very, very cool. So let's get started. Go ahead, Marian. Hi, I'm Marian, she, her pronouns. Um, I'm going to talk about reproductive justice and the reproductive histories of women of color. The reproductive justice movement theories and principles are rooted in the history of reproductive oppression and abuses in communities of color. Having a basis in this history is important because it has allowed for the creation of a movement that has continually centered women's repro reproduction while fighting for healthier communities and a better world. Members of the RJ movement include women of color, socialist feminists, and members of the racial justice movements who have pushed for a more complex reproductive rights discourse. One that acknowledges that different women have varying reproductive experiences, in part depending on their race and class positions. These experiences uh, constitute the need for a holistic reproductive rights movement that aims to undo all forms of oppression. The term reproductive justice was coined in 1994 by black feminists, and it has three primary principles. One, the right to not have a child. Two, the right to have a child. And three, the right to, to, to parent that child in safe and healthy environments. Uh, reproductive justice recognizes that policies aimed at controlling welfare and family caps, access to contraceptive and abortion, the criminalization of pregnant women battling addiction, serve to further white supremacist, capitalist, patriarchal agenda that is intent upon controlling the childbearing of all women in the interests of the elite. 
The entire history of the United States shows how colonizers, slave owners, bosses, and the state have used reproductive capacities to pursue goals around power, wealth, status, and private property. Communities of color, as well as poor whites, have been targeted in distinct and brutal ways. Uh, enslaved persons saw their children taken away uh, or lived with them in servitude. In both cases, enslaved people were not able to assert the autonomy needed to parent. After slavery ended and the births of black children no longer increased the wealth of white slave owners, laws changed to encourage the sterilization of hundreds of thousands of black women. Um, as white settler colonialists moved across North America, many indigenous people lost their land and lives to genocidal wars and the intentional spread of disease. Indigenous people also lost their children to a boarding school system that aimed to erase native language and culture through forced assimilation. The people of Puerto Rico were used as guinea pigs for a range of reproductive technologies such as the birth control pill, unsafe long-acting hormonal contraceptives, and were subject to a massive sterilization campaign. One 1965 sur survey of Puerto Rican residents uh, found that one-third of all Puerto Rican mothers between 20 and 49 were sterilized. Similar to the experience of women in Puerto Rico in the US, black and indigenous women were subject to forced sterilizations. Uh, this practice is not so far behind us. As recently as 2013, it was uncovered that almost 150 women in California prisons between 2006 and 2010 were illegally subject to sterilization. I should also mention racist immigration policies such as anti-Asian immigration restrictions and ongoing, an ongoing terror caused by the, the US immigration system such as family separations and the work of ICE. Uh, welfare and foster care policies are designed to punish the poor by operating under the assumption that having a child is a luxury that they don't deserve because they can't afford it. These policies explicitly target the childbearing of black women who are depicted as welfare queens who intentionally have children to receive public assistance. The Hyde Amendment, which denies federal aid for most abortions, also takes aim at this group. The legal basis for this amendment can be traced back to Supreme Court challenges in which the court ruled that the state has a legitimate interest in encouraging childbirth uh, over abortion. That is, the state somehow has legitimate interest in forcing women to have babies against their will. The prosecution of women for using drugs while pregnant has further penalized the pregnancies of the poor and indignant who are disproportionately targeted by the criminal justice system. Uh, the right pushes for these harsh penalties for so-called crimes against fetuses in order to normalize the notion of fetal, of, of fetal personhood. Uh, the reproduction of communities of color and the poor is also seen as a cause of climate change. There is a strain of eugenic and neo-Malthusian thinking that holds that we can solve the climate crisis by ending overpopulation through contraceptive sterilizations. However, the real issue is overproduction combined with a system that prioritizes profits over sustainability. Blaming overpopulation is an intentional tactic to, uh, intended to mystify the issue by exploiting racial and class biases. Uh, the right has exploited the historical fact of eugenics as well to depict all forms of birth control as genocide. This can be traced back to the early 20th century progressive era when activists did promote uh, control and reproduction of the un of unfit populations through birth control. Margaret Sanger notably worked with eugenicists to further her crusade to expand access to birth control. And by doing so, she forever entangled the issue of reproductive rights with both liberatory and oppressive aims. By the end of the 20th century, these conditions and more led feminists of color to begin organizing around this history and the right to choose when and how they will become parents. Oh, see that my last page is, oh no, it is here. Just kidding. The, when and how they'll become parents. So uh, the right to, which entails the right to resources intended, the right to resources needed to take care of children, the right to access to contraceptives and abortion, and the right to defend their, to define their histories going forward. RJ activists have been on the front lines of fights to get good medical care and decent housing, to have a job that pays a living wage, to live without police harassment, and to live free of racism in safe and healthy environments. Reproductive justice appeals to so many because it has drawn attention to the persistence of this history and made visible what has been buried and suppressed. It provides a systemic critique of liberal capitalism, which always defaults to fascism, to resolve or push past its internal contradictions. Rather than acknowledge or adequately deal with the crises caused by the market, like declining birth rates, unemployment, climate change, the hoarding of resources, and civil unrest, capitalism scapegoats, represses, and murders the other in order to protect the mode of production and deeply flawed society built around it. 
In conclusion, RJ centers the most oppressed and provides a powerful analysis that can radicalize these communities to fight back against the state and the elite. The RJ movement is about ordinary people defining, seeking out, claiming, and holding on to their reproductive safety and dignity in spite of this oppression. Thank you. Go ahead, Jenny. That was a great introduction to the whole day. Um, so most people aren't aware, I think, even now that abortion was legal in the United States um, from col the colonial period, which we've just heard about, um, if it was before quickening, which is around the fourth month and when you can feel the fetus move, and um, since the uh, report of whether the fetus was moving was the, the person who was pregnant, right, that basically meant it was legal um, at any time. And um, we don't see a crackdown in the United States on abortion um, until the late 1860s and early 1870s when state after state, um, at the urging of the medical profession, made abortion illegal um, in all cases. And then in 1873, with the Comstock Law, all information about um, sex, reproduction, birth control, um, and abortion was completely banned and people were raided and arrested and, um, and we had that for a hundred years, basically that system where, um, where abortion was com completely illegal. Um, the abortion reform movement, as opposed to the repeal movement, bumped along in the post-war period um, trying to encourage public discussion of abortion. Um, so feminist abortion strategist Lucinda Sisler um, wrote in 1970 that these folks spent a lot of time debating with priests when life begins and which abortions are justified. She says they were mostly doctors, lawyers, social workers, clergymen, all men, professors, writers, and a few were just plain women, usually not particularly feminist. Um, they drafted model reform laws, creating narrow exceptions to the criminal codes that banned all abortions, um, and they had won some reforms in, in 10 states by 1970. Um, but Sisler, who was really the main strategist for the movement in New York, um, says, part of the reason the reform movement was very small was that it appealed mostly to altruism and very little to people's self-interest. The circumstances covered by reform are tragic, but they affect very few women's lives, whereas repeal is compelling because most women know the fear of an unwanted pregnancy and in fact get abortions for that reason. It is the women's movement whose demand for repeal rather than reform of abortion laws has spurred the general acceleration in the abortion movement and its influence. She, she was writing this before, uh, before the Roe decision. Sisler's group, New Yorkers for Abortion Law Repeal, put out its own model law, which was a blank page, um, to show the difference between reform and repeal. Uh, the group said that abortion should be treated like any other medical procedure. Um, it should fall under no special law restricting where, when, why, how, or by whom it is performed, and it should be completely removed from the criminal code. Um, now, because the reform proposals helped very few people, these exceptions to the, to the law, there was really no mass movement to push for them. The women's liberation movement was the mass movement that was needed for a breakthrough, and after it arose, with demands for a repeal of all the laws, the victories came in quick succession. Um, and I recall this history because we're often told that what we need in the abortion fight is a more professional approach, a clever legal strategy, ex expensive polling research, a publish, uh, you know, a public relations campaign, lots of um, Democratic Party strategists, um, plenty of, and plenty of donations to the groups that are doing these things. But these recommendations have again and again led us back to uh, emphasizing the worst case scenarios, rape, incest, health crisis, um, privacy, and the relationship between the patient and the doctor, um, and the use of confusing euphemisms to avoid the word abortion. And they replay the efforts of the professionals in the 50s and 60s reform movement, and they have produced similarly meager, meager results. I mean, we have gone so far back. Um, 
It was the women's liberation repeal strategy that won us the gains we have, and when it was abandoned, we started to go backward. But I think it's fair to say that something else is going on when we see the intensity of the rollbacks um, that we're experiencing now. Um, and so I'll just, I'll just uh, give a little background and then we can, we can go on. Um, the, the women's liberation movement was started 50 years ago by radicals. Um, they had come out of the civil rights, anti-war, and new left groups. Um, they did not expect that women could be free with capitalism intact. Um, many had already risked their livelihoods and lives in the movement. Um, and while men were sexist in those movements, it was not the only thing that made them to decide to start an independent women's liberation movement. After all, men were sexist outside those movements. That hadn't created a movement. Um, many women's liberation pioneers said that what started them on the path to an independent movement was the positive example of black power. Um, in some cases, they remember an explicit instruction to whites in the civil rights movement to go fight your own oppressors. Um, and most saw organizing women's liberation as recruiting a new constituency to the general freedom movement while creating an independent power base to make sure rhetoric about equality and freedom for all included women. Um, and I think we can say 50 years on that they were right, that women's freedom cannot be won without confronting the power of employers and the rich. Um, as it turned out, the movement made important strides, but they were in areas that didn't cut too deeply into the prerogatives of capital and employers. And in that ca category, call it column A, we have made progress on appearance and dress codes, integration of all male spaces and workplaces, men doing childcare and housework, not enough, but more. Um, better sex, and educational equality. The areas where we are stuck or going backward, we could call it column B, are those that require capitalists to cede control or cough up resources, right? So equal pay, public childcare, paid family leave, um, universal health care, living wage jobs, um, jobs that allow women economic independence from men. Um, in fact, half our progress towards equal pay has been a result of men's wages dropping to meet ours, which was never what we intended when we demanded equal pay. Um, now, due to the fall in the birth rate starting in the 1970s, abortion and birth control have moved from column A, things that don't greatly impinge on the prerogatives of capital, to column B, things that do. And this means that feminist advance now requires a confrontation with the power of capitalists over our reproductive work. In other words, the power structure could accommodate our demands on abortion when birth rates were already quite high, as they were in the 60s. But as birth rates have dropped, they've started coming for our reproductive rights. Um, they want our reproductive labor, and they want it cheap. And if, for a long time, they've been getting it cheap while we face a crisis. This is not the only way they could approach uh, lower birth rates. In other countries that have experienced lower birth rates, they have increased funding for child care, um, put in paid leave for up to two years. Um, uh, they have already have shorter work hours and, and guaranteed health care for everyone. Um, but here in the United States, the solution to the lowered birth rate has just been to come for our reproductive rights. So we also have to take on board that we are facing a slightly different situation than we were in 1973. Oh. No. That's great. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> oh, you're done. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. So, um, first of all, I want to thank all the organizers for having me on this panel. And uh, I want to particularly thank the Socialist Feminist Caucus of the DSA for doing this work for on, on a long-term basis. Um, and outside of sort of electoral spaces to make it an especially activist space. So thank you very much. Um, I also want to um, acknowledge that I'm on a um, panel with some really wonderful activists. And Jenny Brown's book is a very small size like the manifesto, which means 
there are stockings to be filled. <laughs> so this is this is a good time to buy Jenny's book. So it's it's a it's a great book. I've I've read it uh, cover to cover and already have given away several copies. Okay. So what um, following from these two um, excellent panelists, what I'm going to say is kind of try to weave some of this stuff together and present why the strategy, um, why two things are very important. One, framing uh, the question of abortion as reproductive justice, why that is important. And second, why the strategy of confrontation is absolutely essential to actually get to that point of reproductive justice. Yeah? So I'm going to try to weave these things together. And the way that I weave them together is through this very mouthful theory called social reproduction theory, okay, which is what I write about mostly. It is a mouthful, but bear with me as I unpack it in order to show how these things are connected. So um, under capitalism, two kinds of making goes on. One is the making of commodities, okay? Everything that we consume by including material and immaterial objects, right? Service uh, um, and toothpaste. They're all commodities that capitalism sells. So that's one kind of making, the production of commodities. The other kind of making without which the commodity production could not take place is life making. Okay, and how does life making take place? Life making take place directly through the birth of new human beings, but also the, it's not enough that the human beings are born, those human beings are nurtured and sustained within institutions and social spaces. One institution would be the family, where that human being is sustained. The other institutions would be schools, hospitals, public transport, and so on, that, in, uh, that nurtures and cares for um, socially for that human being to become an adult such that they can produce for capital, so produce those commodities. So in these spaces of life making, in the spaces of commodity making, Capital has full control. Your boss can absolutely tell you when to come to work, what to do, and, and so on. In the spaces of life making, however, two, thing, two kind of tendencies go on at the same time, right? One tendency is an actual sense of nurturance. Okay, what you get in your family is actually love and affection outside of uh, um, outside of your workspace. Okay, you meet with your friends and so on. Same in schools, teachers, nurses, and so on actually provide nurturance and support to you, but. These spaces are also within capitalism, so the idea is that the future person who comes out of the spaces is also a commodity producer. So just like, uh, and, and a commodity producer is not a natural thing, right, okay? A commodity producer is an extremely unnatural being, okay? He or she has to be trained to be a commodity producer, okay? It's not natural for us to get up in the morning and go work for someone else, okay? It's extremely unnatural. So those tendencies of how to be a commodity producer are also instilled in these spaces, okay? So the teacher has to teach according to a clock, the day is divided into periods. Okay, why are days divided into periods? This was never the education system in pre-capitalist times. Why do you think days, uh, a school hour is divided into periods? To train you for work, to follow the clock, okay? Uh, the nurse has to be at the bedside for 10 minutes. I just spoke at a nurse's rally and I said, uh, you know, this is an absurd situation. The nurses were like, yeah, tell us about it, right? So 10 minutes next to the bed. So that discipline of capital, and as we all know, families can both be uh, and center for love and affection, as well as theaters of oppression and violence, especially uh, our queer uh, uh, comrades know that very well, okay? So those, so the spaces of life making are kind of more complicated, right? So they have both tendencies of both 
following capitalist logic, but also defying capitalist logic, okay? So those, those are spaces. Now, where do bodies come in? What are our bodies? Our bodies are extremely personal um, spaces for us to take decisions on, but our bodies are also the social space we occupy, literally, okay? Our bodies are inserted because of this into a social space which has its own dynamic. So those social spaces then converge upon our bodies, okay? And the process of life making then is not just life making, but life making within the contours of capitalism, okay? That, is this making sense? Raise your hand if it isn't. Okay, great. So this is then, we are talking about the, the unfolding of living labor within capitalism, okay? Living labor is the precondition. Without living labor, there would be no capitalism. Okay, let's get that sorted, okay? Without our labor, there is no capitalism. So living labor is the basis of capitalism. So life making and life is very, very important concerns for capitalism, particularly because it does not have direct control, okay? So it cannot come into every house and say you must produce children, although it does do that when it's absolutely forced to, for instance, during the slave period in, um, in the American South, as well as in the post-war period for, in, uh, uh, in the 1930s when Stalin is building Soviet Russia, you know, you get medals for being children. So the state does intervene directly and says you must produce. But the point is that in most cases of liberal democracy, capital cannot intervene directly into process of, of life making. So the concern and the anxiety is always there because of that connection to life, life making and living labor, okay? So this is where it comes to the question of the labor force for capitalism, which is the living labor force. And that's the connection or the filament connecting tissues between life, life making, living labor, and the labor force for capitalism, okay? While I'm drawing this map, you have to also understand that in the life making processes, there are uh, potential for intense uh, protest precisely because capital does not have full control, okay? So there are, uh, this is not a Foucauldian, this is not a panopticon necessarily of capital having full control over our bodies and our bodily spaces, but it is a question of us having a clear understanding of what is involved, okay? That both of those uh, categories lie there. So this is where we come back to the question of reproductive justice. As Marion and Jenny both talked about, reproductive justice cannot be simply about abortion. It is the right to have a child, the right not to have a child, and the right if we have children to bring that child up in healthy, safe neighborhoods and not be stalked by ice or the cops, okay? Uh, to have food, to have hospital, to have health care for the bringing up of that child. So now you see, here we go, we are demanding full democratic control over life making. That's essentially what we are demanding here with reproductive justice, which means it is necessarily going to run into capital and the resources that capital will allow us to have. So remember this, capital is about profit making, not life making. So whenever it is in crisis, it will take from life making resources and channel it into profit making resources. This is why the first cuts come to not CEO salaries or taxation, the first cuts come to public health, public transport, public schools, okay? Because those are the spaces of life making. That's which, that's where capital goes first. So, um, so now I want to introduce, because I'm running out of time, the question of the feminist universal, okay? Feminist uh, um, movement has always stumbled on two things. 
Um, one is uh, the sort of feminism, which is about equal rights with men, okay? And as the uh, anti-capitalist feminists of the 1970s, my mom's generation would say, if you are, it was a very good slogan from my mother's generation, which is, if you are aiming for equal rights with men, you are not ambitious enough. Okay, and as we saw that what Jenny said was right now, equal rights with men essentially means equal uh, wages which are both super low. That cannot be our, uh, you know, uh, that cannot be our demand. Um, so this, um, so there's the equal rights feminism that we want equal rights of, with men within the structure of capitalism. And then there's the anti-capitalist feminism which wants to project feminism as one of the modes of human emancipation, okay? Because when we demand full democratic control over our life making, we demand free healthcare, free education, we demand full free public transport sustainable uh, towards the ecology, then we are actually demanding the building blocks for universal emancipation, not just the emancipation of women. So this is a very different kind of feminism and anti-capitalist feminism that we are advocating, which is what I will call the feminist universal. And by feminist universal, I mean, how does it apply to abortion rights? It applies to abortion rights like this. Abortion rights for equality feminists are, it's a matter of law, okay? We need it's not like a wrap-up, <laughs> someone down the hall. It's, uh, or they're, they're agreeing <laughs> that we need a feminist universal. <laughs> yeah, so, um, so the, the point is, for equality feminism, if we see feminism as a limited mode, right, then we can say uh, abortion rights is about the law. And it is about the law. We do want legally free abortion for all. But it is not just about the law. Because let's say it, abortion is legal now in the United States, which it is. But think about how impossible it is for the vast majority of women to access abortion. In other words, the state and capital have put in institutions, some of which has to do with wages, some of it which has to do with race, some of it which has to do with uh, just simply cutting off access, which makes legal abortion a, a, an almost like an inaccessible thing. So it's not just about the law. The law can only be a starting point, okay? We have to go beyond the law. So juridical equality, under capitalism can only be a starting point. What we need to argue for in a feminist universal is all people, not just women, all people having full, equal, democratic control over our avenues of life making. Because what intervenes between us, our bodies, and life making is something called the wage. It is through the wage that we have to access our life making. Yeah, universal feminism argues that people should have direct control over their avenues of life making without the wage. For, and one very clear first step is that your processes of life making, including abortion, including babies, including education, should not be connected to the wage. Right? So no one should say that you can only have health care if you have insurance through your employer. You can only go to, do you know, one of the things that shocked me when I came to the United States was I had an um, undergraduate in my class who had served three times in the military in Iraq and had his chest blown apart. And the state of Indiana had given him free education because he had uh, some star from the US military because half his chest was blown away uh, in a war. So I thought that the state will give you, you have to basically almost die in order to get a basic human right, which is free college education. 
This is the kind of country it is. So this is the system that emphasizes death making and the making of things rather than life making and the making of life. So a universal feminism is absolutely about the um, enhancing the parameters of reproductive justice to not just include the, um, the question of abortion and birth, but to include the question of life making in these both personalized and institutionalized forms in society. And that can only happen when we get rid of the wage. So it can only be waged as an anti-capitalist fight. Thank you. So um, thank you all very much. Um, just wanted to welcome again people, a lot of people trickled in um, as our speakers were speaking. So just wanted to say welcome and thank you for coming. Um, my name is Leah, I'm a member of the DSA Socialist Feminist Working Group and also New York City for Abortion Rights. Um, and I'm gonna be kind of moderating the, the conversation here. I definitely have like some questions, um, but I want to, um, that I wanted to ask the speakers, but I wanted to open it up um, we're trying, part of our goal for today is, the, again, the combination of political education and activism, that often those spaces are divided and we want to bring them into one space where different activist groups have a chance to meet each other, people can get plugged into activism, but we don't think you can have a strategy without some politics, right? Your politics inform your strategy, so part of the conversation today throughout the day is what kind of politics should guide um, our fight for reproductive justice. Um, so please raise your hands, um, I will take, um, a few questions and the speakers can get a chance to respond to them. And again, I have, um, I have my own questions, but wanna get some people out there first. Okay, I see you, anyone else? Okay, go ahead, why don't you start us off. I'm Betty Maloney, I'm with Radical Women, a socialist feminist group. We've been around since 1967. And I've been active in defending clinics since 1978. Um, the thing I want to mention is what Marion, you know, mentioned. That was the more radical elements of the feminist movement were talking about reproductive justice in the beginning. It was the liberals that came in and watered it down. And one of the things that gets lost and has always been a problem that I find, you know, when talking to other feminists is the role of women of color, especially black women, in the fight for reproductive justice. I was living in Seattle when I first became a socialist feminist, and it was there in Washington State where women of color, black women from the Central Ward of Seattle, one, you know, took the fight for reproductive rights, to, for abortion rights, and put it on the front page where it was always mentioned in the obituary page. And that was the turning point for that issue to be addressed by Washington State, which was one of the first states to win, you know, abortion rights. But it also had, their fight was also talking about sterilization abuse, about 24-hour ch child care, about comparable worth. And so it was always those issues. And, um, and I remember the first thing I did is when I was coming around radical women, a, one of the African-American women in the organization was giving birth to her second child. We had round-the-clock um, vigil or being at her bedside to make sure that they didn't do a hysterectomy on her and uh, because of the whole issue of sterilization of women of color. So I think it's real important that that whole reproductive uh, justice analysis of the movement gets talked about. It was there in the beginning. It was fought for, and it was wiped out by the liberal feminists who eventually sold out. And they were always, when they sold out all those other issues, they were selling out women of color. Thank you. And that's, uh, you know, that's part of the history and we have to talk about it. So I'm glad you raised all those issues. Thank you for your contribution. Um, is there anyone else I have? some questions I wanted to ask, but I don't wanna, wanna make sure people get their questions answered as well. Yeah, go ahead. 
Um, hi, I'm Charlotte. Thanks for the great panel. Um, I, I apologize if this is redundant because I missed um, Leah's intro at the very beginning, so I'm not sure if you spoke to this, so ignore it if so, if Leah answered all my questions. Um, I was wondering if, sort of, um, based on the ground each of you covered, if any of you want to comment sort of on what this particular moment is like for fighting for abortion rights but reproductive justice broadly in the ways that have been described because um, one of the reasons I wanted to come today is because I found it like a, a quite odd moment in that way. Like of course we had the huge women's marches but then as many of the comrades here know, um, you know, it's not that we've had mass clinic defenses or other kinds of feminist demos in the wake of that. We have a context where Medicare for all has probably never been talked about more nationally, but I continue to be shocked, and Tithi's of course right, we shouldn't reduce this to electoral politics, but I continue to be shocked that the amount of time we talk about Medicare for all in the um, debates, for example, and even Bernie, who's Medicare for all, uh, program includes a lot of reproductive justice provisions doesn't necessarily center that even in answers about Roe v. Wade and abortion. So I'm just trying to think that through and wondering what you all think. Thank you. I'm going to throw it back to the speakers to take on that question. Do you want to? Um, Not everyone has to answer if you don't want to, but I'll give everyone an opportunity to answer each question. Um, yeah, I agree. Um, I feel overall optimistic about the current moment, maybe because I'm in this DSA bubble where I know so many people doing good work around it. I think your point about Bernie Sanders is good. There was one of the uh, recent Democratic debates where he was asked explicitly, what would you do if Roe v. Wade is overturned? And his answer was something like, oh, it would just be covered in my plan. It was very much an afterthought. I think he wasn't expecting the question to come, and my thought is, it is so essential for abortion to be covered in Medicare for all, but it doesn't cover the fact that there are so few abortion clinics, it doesn't cover some of the other aspects of costs and access in terms of getting to abortion. Obviously, it does cover the actual costs. I think abortions are $500 to get, and they would be less expensive, but things like the travel time, the missed work, the 48-hour waiting period, you have to have to make two appointments in order to get abortion. So obviously, I wanted a way more comprehensive answer from him and didn't get that, and that does give me anxiety and doesn't bode well. Um, but overall, I think that uh, we do live in a time where more and more people are turning to the left, more and more people are interested in anti-capitalism, and I feel personally optimistic about things, but I don't know how others feel. Yeah, um, I th that's a really good point about, um, about the clinics and you know, most hospitals do not do elected abor elective abortions because they're they're worried about their reputation, right? And um, there's an interesting lesson from when when Medicare was first passed. Um, the most hospitals in the South, all hospitals in the South, and many hospitals in the North were segregated by race, um, and. Medicare funds were, were not released to hospitals unless they desegregated, and this was an enormous um, hammer to create desegregation in, in hospitals. Um, and I think, you know, the Medicare for all could say, no, you have to provide abortions, and um, you don't get any money unless you do. So that, that would be one way to force that to happen. Um, I think, you know, what we're facing right now is the current strategy by big feminist organizations and nonprofits is based on a misunderstanding of how we want abortion rights in the first place. So basically, it's attributed to the Supreme Court. Um, and as a result, these folks who are running the big organizations that you think of, Planned Parenthood, NARAL, um, have a model of change that involves fitting in, being respectable, convincing opponents with your logic and credentials, um, rather than power, which is how we won originally, and then they hide what they imagine to be the more unsavory aspects of abortion. Um, you know, women carelessly getting them, using them as birth control, um, and then they relentlessly use the word choice to avoid abortion. So um, I think one of the things that we need to do is we need to fight back against all of that. Um, and uh, we, you know, basically, our strategy right now is being run by people who are looking at polls and are saying, oh, well, 
20% of people think abortion should be illegal in all cases, and then there's another 30 or 40% who think it should be available in some cases, so let's do what those people want in order to cobble together a majority that would be for abortion. Um, and this is not how the movement won abortion to begin with. We won by demanding uh, basically free abortion on demand. So I think we need to get back to thinking about that, and I think that would really, um, that would really change some of the political calculations that politicians are having to make. Thanks, Charlotte, for that question. Um, I think that's the crucial one, really. Um, so first of all, I think we need to go back to the question. Uh, we need to go back to the slogan or the understanding, the public consciousness, that your reason for your abortion is the right reason. OK, so that's the primary thing. It doesn't matter what it was. Your reason is the right reason, okay? Now, how do we get there? When you say there isn't an abortion movement, what we are, and, and you're right, there isn't a mass abortion movement in the United States right now, but what there isn't really is a mass feminist movement in the United States. If we look at what is happening in Argentina, in Chile, in, um, in Ireland, what gave the uh, birth to the fantastic no vote, you know, they all came out of a massive mobilization prior to the passage of whatever. So it was a social movement. So what we are lacking is not just there isn't an abortion movement, we are lacking a massive feminist mobilization, which is a, uh, which is a shame and a little strange in the sense because Latin America is up in arms, okay? So every time you speak to Latin American feminists anywhere in Latin America, it is the feminist movement that is inciting the workers' movement, not the other way around in Latin America right now, okay? So, and look at Spain, you know, and, and so on. So a lot of the countries of the European South, um, as well, well, except Poland, but um, mm -hmm. which is also up in arms, uh, and particularly of Global South, it is the feminist organizing and the mass feminist movement that is actually inciting other social movements. And that's what we are lacking in the United States right now, okay? And I'm actually very fearful of 2020, where all our energies go into the electoral campaign and we lose, uh, because, you know, US elections, for for those of us who do not belong to the United States, um, and for those of you who do, you're just used to it, but the US elections are unlike any other elections in the on the entire planet. You know, the kind of uh, money uh, that goes into electing the head of the imperialist state, uh, the kind of resources that go in can suck the life out of, you know, social movements to a certain extent. I want to see Bernie elected, absolutely. Um, but the point is that if all our energies go into the electoral campaign, I'm a little scared for 2020. So that's my hesitation. But I think in a concrete way, uh, you know, things that Jenny and Marin have said, I just want to add on to that. One of the things we can do uh, as collectives and networks is what we've been tr uh, trying to do uh, in our very small way is bring uh, comrades from the countries where mass mobilization has taken place and have them tour in various feminist spaces in uh, in uh, the United States, okay, to recount their experience. Uh, the Socialist Feminist Caucus in Chicago of the DSA had a wonderful, very successful educational panel with a PESOL comrade from Argentina, uh, part of the feminist uh, movement there. I was on the panel and a CT, black CTU teacher, okay? And it was a great panel because it was this conversation about a feminist universal, okay? Or a feminist international. What does it look like? It has to be working class, has to be anti-capitalist, it has to center reproductive justice. So we can certainly, this is what I call global translations. So not translations of texts, but actually translations of movements. This is something we can facilitate as an active internationalist uh, project to bring feminist speakers from the countries which have seen these movements and kind of start that conversation here. Cool, thank you. And I also just want to highlight some of the panels coming up um, later today. There's women's strikes and reproductive justice in the workplace. 
There's Medicare for All and Reproductive Justice, which I think is gonna take up specifically some of the questions that was just raised. And the last one's gonna be on confronting the right um, and the clinic defense tactics. So I think part of today is also discussing um, how to begin to build, you know, the kind of networks and organization that will produce the mass mobilization that's so lacking um, here in the United States, um, for sure. Um, this is sort of like a more general question, but I, I do want to like make sure this panel is able to cover also some of the um, the kind of history and context setting for the rest of the day. But I'm curious what the um, panelists thinks about kind of some of the more important lessons from prior feminist movements. I know it's kind of a broad question, but I think um, for many, I guess I'll speak for myself, but just looking around the room, it's like we were never part, and you know, and this is probably true for panelists, you know, we're never part, part of like a mass movement, you know, in the same way that the 60s and 70s in this country um, kind of produced. And so it produced a lot that was great and a lot that failed, you know, like there wasn't, we weren't successful, you know, um, as a left in the 1960s and actually pushing through the kind of demands that we're talking about through reproductive justice. So I'm curious what you guys think about sort of some of the most important lessons we can learn from past um, feminist movements, both kind of the positive um, and the negative. Um, lessons from the past. Jenny and I were talking about this a little bit before the panel. One thing that Fred Stockings really pushed that I think is a really important lesson is questioning uh, the professionalization of the medical field and questioning male authority. Uh, there is a Red Stockings pamphlet that argues that um, as so long as those abortions take place in hospitals and are done by professional people, they'll always be expensive and elitist. And they really push the idea that everyone should learn how to do an abortion, that we should make it this widespread, more common practice. And now I think that movement has switched to trying to make the abortion pill more available. Already as it stands, some 30% of abortions are done using the pill. So I think that's just an important lesson to question authority, people who say that they're the experts that Jenny's mentioned a few times. Lessons from the past, um, or mistakes that could have been done better. I think always being inclusive. Uh, I think socialist feminists and radical feminists didn't make as many mistakes as liberal feminists did in terms of trying to earn, earn the same status as men, but there were still women of color who had negative experiences trying to organize in feminist groups. So I think trying to listen to women of color and trying to have a movement that's big and inclusive is important. Um, so the, the main thing that organized the women's liberation movement of the 1960s was uh, was basically their their initial program was consciousness raising, which was to analyze our lives and figure out what we wanted to happen differently. Um, but first, you need to sort of analyze what's going on, and so um, that has been extremely valuable in in the organizing that National Women's Liberation does. When we worked for ten years to get the morning after pill over the counter in the United States from 2003 to 2013, we were actually successful in getting that. Um, the first thing that the nonprofit industrial complex types said to us was, oh, couldn't you do something more reasonable like, um, like getting uh, emergency contraception in the, in the emergency room? Um, and they even had a cute thing for it, EC in the ER. Um, and so we did consciousness raising, and um, those of us who had been raped, had not gone to an emergency room. Most of us who needed the morning after pill had not been raped, so we decided that was not what we needed. So I think we need to base our, our demands on what we need. Then later, we had this uh, experience of being, um, uh, tr they tried to divide us by age. Oh, well, we'll make it over the counter if you're over 18 and then later over 17. And, um, we looked at our experience again and we said, this is ridiculous. First of all, um, when, when we needed the morning after pill, it was mostly when we were younger. Um, and when you're younger, it's even harder to get a doctor's appointment and get a prescription and to pay for it and do all the things that you need to do when it's, when it's um, not available on the shelf. So, um, so they tried to divide us, and I think this goes a little bit to what Mary was saying, you know, um, do not sell out part of your group, right? So um, 
an age, the age requirement would not just block young people, it would mean that everybody had to present an ID, not everybody has an ID, not everybody wants to present an ID. Um, and so we fought that and finally got it, uh, got it over the counter for everyone. Um, so I think that's an important part. Um, I think um, this idea of going for what we really want, which was another uh, principle of, of the women's liberation movement, that means big universal demands that include everyone. Um, you know, we've been fighting for over 40 years to try to get rid of the Hyde Amendment. Um, and the problem with that is that even if we got rid of the Hyde Amendment, which bans federal funds from being used for abortion, including Medicaid, um, we would still have a situation where the average abortion is still $530 if you're not on Medicaid. So um, it's basically, the smaller the demand, the smaller your constituency is going to be. We need to make the large demand. So I think we have a chance right now to go for the bigger demands, like obviously Medicare for all, including full reproductive freedom. So um, that and they, there's another example from from the Irish struggle where, for decades, they had been trying to reform the law. For example, oh, let's fight to have it be. If you're suicidal, you can get an abortion, and you only need to get one shrink to certify you instead of two. That kind of stuff went nowhere because it didn't unite the vast majority of people who wanted abortion rights. What united them was when they actually started in 2016 and 2017 to demand free, safe, legal abortion for everybody. Um, so that I think that is also a big area that we need to do. And then finally, on abortion pills, um, I think there are enormous opportunities for creative strategies on this. There's already, a, a, you know, a bunch of underground networks to provide abortion pills to people who need them. Um, but I think what we need to do as a movement is we need to start asking why are they not available to everybody? Why are they not over the counter? What are all these restrictions? The FDA has slapped restrictions on them so they're not available in a retail pharmacy. You have It has to be a clinic. You have to provided, the doctor has to provide it, all of these restrictions, um, if those restrictions could be lifted and or if we could make it an uh, uh, over-the-counter drug, then we would, have, we would vastly increase the uh, availability of abortion. Um, but in order to do that, we need to challenge the law publicly, not just avoid the law. So that's, I think that's also on our agenda. Okay, so um, I think there's um, three three things that uh, I wish we could do over from the past. Uh, first of all, I think what we don't need to do over from the past is, um, as, as the evidence shows and all the oral histories show, that the feminist uh, women's liberation movement arose out of inspiration from the civil rights movement, okay? So all these, fem uh, all these future feminists went down to the South to do um, a freedom school and all of this stuff, which is what made the, gave them a sense of a mass movement and they gave them a sense of injustice. So, I mean, that kind of interracial struggle is something we do need to learn from the past and try to uh, reproduce in, in our times. The two things that I think uh, we need to um, do better this time, one is the question of political independence, that the women's liberation movement absolutely needs to have the new women's movement um, that is centering itself around these issues absolutely needs to be politically independent from large organizations, uh, from um, established political parties such as the Democrats and the Republicans, and it, it needs to be independent of large NGOs, okay? So it has to be a grassroots-based mass or movement which does not pay homage to any of these big uh, centers. So political independence is absolutely crucial. Within political independence, uh, but within that movement, if we get it, I think a second thing is what we need to um, move 
uh, towards, which is, uh, I'll borrow the term from the trade union movement, we need a militant minority within the feminist movement, okay? Because when the feminist movement comes, it will be a large, massive upsurge, okay? It's gonna have liberals, it's gonna have, um, some of them will say things like, you know, oh, abortion only during rape, but I'm up for other things, you know, so it's gonna have a whole medley of things. And with Within that, we need a clear militant minority who argues for the things we are arguing for in this room, okay? And remember, uh, and this militant minority will can will should be able to operate not just within a uh, militant feminist movement, but within any social movement that arises in the coming days, right? So, for instance, look at the way the abortion movement became massive. Okay, where did this impetus come from? It didn't just come from the abortion movement. Most of the people who hit the streets for the abortion movements in Ireland had hit the streets. Streets uh, months before for the water privatization movement. Okay, it's because they fought against the privatization of water and won that gave them the confidence the second time around, the experience as well of camaraderie, of solidarity, and they said, okay, we can do it, okay? So that's the kind of lesson we need to learn as well, that we need to organize these kind of things that we are doing today, okay? Organize networks, infrastructure, building, activist infrastructure which can then operate as a militant minority in the social movements of tomorrow in order to put forward the demands that we are putting forward today. And that is going to lay the basis perhaps of a feminist movement or within, if it is a feminist movement, it is going to lay the basis for a much wider emancipatory movement. Cool, thank you. Um... I'm gonna ask another question, but I don't wanna like take space from other questions. So if there is, does anyone have like a burning question they wanna ask our speakers before I continue to dominate the conversation? You need water? Yes. Okay, um, go ahead. I have a question, just actually, and I just want to get about how we don't have a feminist movement right now, because that took me aback just because I think we, we have had one called Me Too, like the feminist movement, that was a real movement, right? Mm -hmm. Like, sometimes I don't know what things get to qualify as a movement, but the Me, Me Too definitely made waves, and I think people are talking about feminism now more than ever in a lot of ways, and I think maybe it's paved some ground for us to build on, like, mm -hmm. what does it mean to, you know, fight for our bodily autonomy, and, and you know, we can't, it's like an argument about consent that I think definitely applies to the abortion rights movement. So I'm just wondering about, I, um, Thank you. yeah, I think, so I, I don't know, I think uh, uh, I'm just trying to figure out what that means for us. Like, like isn't there a feminist movement right now? Are there openings for us um, to, and, and, and then what does political independence look like if we wanna be, have broad appeal and be grassroots? Like I'm seeing a lot of, excitement around getting more women elected and and a lot of the times their politics actually do reflect my politics surprisingly even when they're running in the democratic party i think like may, maybe it, like can we be politically independent but also support those campaigns or um yeah i don't know i just it just rose a lot of questions for me what you were saying great mm -hmm. you just want to respond or? should i respond yeah, okay um, all right, thank you. So I think um, this is very crucial, okay, because I do think Me Too was a very important moment, and I think it did the work of consciousness raising to a fantastic level. And one of the things that I want to add on to that is the queer liberation movement and the trans uh, movement that is ongoing right now that is also disrupting these ideas of heteronormativity and patriarchal norms, okay? So both of those, I think, have been very, very crucial in t sort of turning the tide in terms of perception of our times. But what 
and, and Me Too actually goes beyond perception because it actually helped topple some big bosses, right? And so today, you know, the white male professor in a classroom is going to think at least twice before he kind of invites the young graduate student into his office, right? So because there might be some consequences. So it has had some... The, the problem is that we haven't had a sustained movement on the streets to actually enforce that consciousness in institutions, right? So we've had stray, um, I would say, uh, spectacular effects like Weinstein and some other guys, NBC and so on, but what we haven't had is on a day-to-day -day level a sustained movement on the ground that actually forces the culture of some of these workplaces to change. Because one of the things that Me Too brought to attention was not simply the, so the news that uh, women are exploited was not news to us. It was news to New York Times, right? But it wasn't news to us. Me Too was something that we knew happened all the time, and it just, we were astonished that the New York Times would actually post it, right? So that was the surprise. Um, but what it brought to mind, and it hasn't been talked about really a lot, is what Me Too also brought attention to, which is the unbelievably undemocratic nature, the dictatorial nature of the American workplace. Okay, so that's one of the things that Me Too really focused its attention on, even though the liberal papers would not talk about that very much. They mainly talked about the evil uh, individual men, right? So what, why do I bring that up? I bring that up because they, Me Too managed to topple some evil individual men, but it didn't manage to challenge the dictatorial nature of the workplace, right? So in other words, if Me Too had been then taken up by trade unions, which it really should have, AFL-CIO should have had a Me Too committee, right, and enforced this in every affiliated union, okay? But it didn't, because Me Too was seen as a feminist issue. It is not a feminist issue. It is a universal emancipation issue, okay? So that kind of limiting of Me Too as, you know, sort of just simply a question of sexual consent of individuals actually limited the scope of it becoming a mass movement. And so I think, but I completely agree with you that it changed thinking to a large extent, and it actually made some evil men go away, so that's, that's definitely a gain. The, your second question is obviously more contentious. Uh, what shall we do with AOC, okay? Well, I think we should vote AOC, definitely, right? But I think we should absolutely um, make certain, the pull on AOC is much greater than the pull on you and me. Okay, the pull for her to conform, vote on a budget that approves of military spending, the pressure on her to vote on that budget is much higher than for uh, the pressure on you and me. So what is gonna make her stop voting on the military budget? If you and me are out on the street demanding accountability from AOC and demanding that she not vote on the military budget, instead that she travel to Texas like she did and speak at uh, ICE detention centers, okay? So in other words, voting AOC should not be the the uh, end of our account, uh, responsibility, it should only be the start, because it is us being in the street that keeps AOC accountable to us, rather than gives AOC the power to do good for us. Okay, so we don't need AOC to do good for us. What we need to do is leverage her being there to actually demand good that is rightfully ours. Thank you. Uh, I'm glad that you brought up me too, because I just think that's from, from my lifetime one of like maybe the larger cultural shifts that I kind of experienced and witnessed. That I really agree with what you know you just said that there's like a massive cultural shift that's taken place that hasn't necessarily translated again into a feeling of power in a workplace. Right? No one goes to work feeling powerful to confront their boss. Um, unless you're in a very, very active um, militant union, which very few people 
um, are in this country. So I think sort of translating for me the question of like the cultural shift into a question of where can you actually access and build social power um, is sort of the key question. That's why I think that sort of infrastructure of the left that is, a, is a useful um, framework because if we don't have infrastructure of the left to actually build social power, which electoral politics cannot do on their own, um, I think that's the sort of the demand, I guess, or like the, the pressing need of a feminist today is building that kind of infrastructure um, that can last through the ups and downs, both of the ups and downs of our movements, but also the ups and downs of the election cycle. Because in this country, there's no non-election cycle. We are always <laughs> in you know, an election. And so I think this question of the relationship between electoral politics and social movements and social power is like a, a really, a really, really critical one. Um, we have five minutes left, um, and I'm going to just give you guys a chance to have some final um, thoughts. Um, before I do that, I wanna say that um, people are still walking in, which is great, um, welcome. Um, we did everything possible to make this day free um, for people after like a long work week. There's like bagels and coffee here. Um, we're gonna have a nice lunch um, from a good Middle Eastern spot. We have a great socialist bake-off happening. People donated their, their labor of love and we'll have that. Um, we are asking for donations, however, to make this day possible. Um, and so there are signs around and we will probably pass like a box in the next session for people to donate cash and like a little Venmo place. But if you can, please do donate. If you can, we cannot, we totally, um, we totally understand. But we do wanna um, be able to do these kinds of events um, again. So um, I guess, yes. Yeah, I, we only have like three minutes. Do you guys want to um, yeah. say just some final, final thoughts based on that conversation, and maybe for the rest of the day, if you have kind of. Some yeah, I, I would. I, I think one of the problems, and maybe the reason that we're not seeing the kind of mass movements that we're seeing in other places, is that a lot of people in the U.S. really don't believe that the system is going to come for them. They think their class, race, or education will protect them. Um, and this is one problem with an otherwise helpful emphasis on privilege, but capitalism will happily kill you if it will turn a profit. Your white skin will not protect you, a college degree will not protect you, this system is deadly, and the sooner we recognize that, all of us, the stronger the movement will be. Um, we think, uh, you know, that, uh, and you sometimes even hear radicals saying this, oh, well, this doesn't affect me, I'll always be able to get abortion, birth control, health care. Don't be too sure. To be in solidarity, you have to understand your own stake in the battle. Um, and as the International says, we want no condescending saviors to rule us from their judgment halls. In other words, you are not a good ally if you don't even understand your own stake. So I think this is, the, uh, this is one of the things that we really need to look at carefully, and that's why consciousness raising is so effective. Um, yeah, just to add on to that, uh, one point I always try to get across to uh, comrades in DSA doing work around abortion or reproductive justice is that abortion access should just be one part of it in a broader movement. We shouldn't lose sight of trying to get other demands that recognizing that access to abortion is important to being free, but so are all these other issues that we've talked about, uh, organizing in workplaces, Medicare for all. So trying not to limit demands to abortion would be an important takeaway, I'd say. So one of the things that I would like us all to do, I think, is um, abolish this idea of an uh, only women's feminist issue. That's why I talk about the feminist universal, okay? Prison abolition is a feminist issue, okay? Fighting the police is a feminist issue. Fighting for higher wages for all is a feminist issue. So this idea of a feminist issue only being about abortion law is, is absolute complete nonsense. So what, and we even have, so what we wanna do is in our organizations where we fight for wages, we need to 
bring demands of feminism, anti-imperialism, and anti-racism into our organizations where we fight for wages, like our trade unions. Similarly, in our organizations where we fight for anti-imperialism, fight for feminism, and fight for anti-racism, our BDS struggles, our feminist struggles, our BLM struggles, we need to raise the question of uh, uh, wages and uh, Medicare for all, okay? So this kind of infecting each other's struggles must go on, okay? And that is one of the crucial tasks of the future because what we need to understand is we are not going to be in the struggle because we think that this struggle deserves our support. I am in the struggle for prison abolition, not because my, I have a friend in prison, which I do, or because I'm a, I, as an immigrant I might be in prison, but I may never be in prison, but I am for prison abolition because my freedom is tied up with that. Okay, men should join the feminist struggle because their emancipation is tied up with ours. This is the spirit of solidarity that we need to build in the coming struggles. Great, so next up we have um, about a 10 minute break and then we're gonna move to women's strikes and the reproductive justice in the workplace. Um, thank you again for our amazing panelists and then one thing I want to um, challenge people to is we really want this to be like a get to know you space. So during the break, if you want to like introduce yourself to someone you don't know, say what you thought about the last panel, I think that'd be a good way to kind of continue getting to know each other. Thanks everyone.